O'er the wild windy sea, I can hear her calling to me. So let's heave away, haul away, and fill our eyes with the shore. Calls to friends, ale and light, and a tale to brighten the night. So heave away, haul away, and heed the siren song. Yar har, fiddle dee dee, ladies and gentlemen, it's me, your host. David Bradbury, and I'm here with the other host with the most, Space Ghost, Coast to Coast. That's your Bro, cue. I have the I have the most Space Ghost. <laughs> it's a, it's an old MF Doom lyric. But anyway. Jack yeah, Space Ghost is dope. <laughs> Jack McFarling, here I am. Yeah. Space Ghost is dope, dude, honestly. What a what a cool guy. What a cool host. A host we can only hope to be. But anyway, you're listening to the Salty Siren Podcast. You better keep all of that in, Jack. Um, oh yeah, we are. Okay, good. Uh, the podcast where Jack and I talk about anything boat, sea, or maritime related that we feel like. So, with that... Uh, yeah. Let's. If it uh, is less dense than water, we talk about it. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> All right, Jack. Do you want to take a guess at what today's topic is? Actually, I will even I will give you a hint. I will give you a hint, and that hint is going to be a number. 16,683. Any ideas? Um, Is that the number of people that the gray ghost could carry? God fucking damn it. Okay, yep. Hey, let's go. (laughs) So, Jack, got it. We are talking about the HMS Queen Mary today, the Grey Ghost, the Titanic's prettier wartime cousin, um, all sorts of fancy stuff, and a really, really cool non-military ship. I guess military in a sense, but we'll get into that. So... Jack, how uh, how knowledgeable are you on the Grey Ghost? Because, as you know, this was one of the topics that you suggested for us a little while back. So what's uh, yeah. what's your history with the ghosty girl? Um, well, I, I came across it, um, or I heard about it, rather. Um, I was watching that the BuzzFeed Unsolved series... Um, specifically the paranormal series where uh shane and um ryan visit haunted places in america and it's it's really it's really fun if you haven't seen it um but they they visited the the queen mary as on their like haunted tour and they even like stayed the night on it so um i know it is I don't want to spoil too much, so it's a. I know it's a ship with a long and uh, colorful history, um, kind of meant for one thing and kind of became a different thing and became very legendary. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know anything about the spooky history of the ship. I I managed to completely glaze over that in the research that I do for this which as you can see dear listeners is very in depth no holes at all perfect information um so maybe you'll be able to teach us something about it but if you would like we can launch into things sound good to you let's a go it's a me it, mario mario all right so we've got the hms queen mary 
At this point, just the Queen Mary. So, Queen Mary starts construction in 1930 in Clydebank, Scotland. Uh, she's owned by this one, I, honestly, they're not important, but this shipbuilding service. Uh, they start building the thing, and they face some pretty major setbacks because, you know, it's 1930. Uh, things going on in the world back then didn't exactly lend themselves to a whole lot of luxury cruise liners being built, and so the Queen Mary was facing some pretty major setbacks. Yeah, now, one day, man, you're just you're just trying to build a boat, and then you get tuberculosis and die, and that's it. Yep, that's what the 30s were about, tuberculosis. <laughs> oh, goodness. But uh, the company that was uh, building the Queen Mary, and this is why I said they were unimportant, uh, they were bought by White Star Line of Titanic fame. Uh, so was kind of interested to learn that the uh, the company that made Titanic was, you know, doing just fine, basically, even even after that. So, Any press is good press. I, I guess so. But uh, they, so they merged with White Star Line. I'm pretty sure White Star Line bought them out. And even then... They were like, man, we're just not going to get this fucking ship finished. And so the British Navy eventually steps in and is like, damn, this is a big ship. And so they agreed to kind of help finish up construction and basically funded the rest of the completion of the Queen Mary. So pretty much immediately once she's done... Uh, the Queen Mary does like a little teensy bit of, uh, you know, just kind of like for fun, like European and Americans frolicking back and forth on transatlantic voyages. But, uh, she was rated for, I believe, three and a half thousand passengers. And that's important because we're gonna fucking obliterate that number. So, yeah, man, this was a, if I remember from the video, this was a nice, this was a nice ship. It had like two or three full bars, like two swimming pools, um, a, like a big ballroom. Like, what do you need a, what do you need a swimming pool on a boat for? Do, uh, <laughs> hey, you want to be in the water, but not in the water water, you know? That's me. <laughs> so regardless the queen mary was a like luxury cruise liner she was real nice for her time but uh she pretty quickly started going over that 3.5 k uh passenger number because a significant number of people were seeing kind of what our our good buddy Adolf was doing over in uh, over in the Rhineland and said, "I don't like this," and so decided to leave and basically evacuate from Europe. That uh, combined with uh, a lot of Jewish families that were able to get out, uh, they upped her standard uh, passenger carrying on. European to North American trips to 4,000 passengers, uh, but she would often go above that, 4,500, sometimes even up to 5,000 uh, commercial passengers, mostly people fleeing what they could see was going to be a bad time in Europe. But then... Okay, so, wait, so at this point it wasn't a, it wasn't like the government was like mandating that the Queen Mary transport refugees, like people were just like buying like cruise line tickets just to get to get out of Dodge. I think it was some of both. I think uh, Europe and the UK were heavily encouraging 
the Queen Mary to take refugees and, uh, you know, people out of Europe. But at the point where it was doing this sort of early evacuating, uh, war had not officially been declared yet. It wouldn't be until uh, September 3rd in 1939 that uh, the Prime Minister of the UK at that time, Chamberlain, uh, would declare war, and that's uh, that's when the Queen Mary really came into her own. But before that, I think it was some amount of people just buying tickets and some amount of encouragement from uh, the UK and Europe of like, yeah, get these people out of here. So, they ended up Groupons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ye oldie. I guess ye oldie's too old, but like, uh, fucking, what would a 1940s Groupon be called? What would it be called? Let's, let's, uh, let's think on back and circle, circle back on that. Yeah, it'd probably be like some scantily clad woman with curled hair, big old, uh, pointed titties. <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. Why was that a side tangent here? Why was that a fashion thing in the forties? Like the pointed bra, or just like uh, earlier times? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, you know, like it. <laughs> at what point was someone like, yeah, dude? Uh, this will be the new uh, fucking fashion statement. Just like. Missile warhead bazongas, <laughs> <laughs> torpedo launchers. I, I mean, like, ever since you told me about like that one thing, um, you know, the reason men's haircuts are short is because yeah. of World War One, when their heads were getting infested with lice and fleas. Like, you you had to cut your hair short. So, you know, we could we could take a guess, but there's undoubtedly some very bizarre reason why pointed boobs were this were the thing hey listeners if you know why uh torpedo tits <laughs> oh, i feel like this is making that's what they called out. me in college <laughs> i feel like this is making us out to be much worse people than we are but if you know why those were such a major fashion movement throughout kind of the 40s 50s and all of that please let us know because there's usually a reason for such things uh I, I i do doubt that like housewives back then were just like yeah give me give me the pointy the pointy bra that not angular cool. enough <laughs> i want to be looking like a ps1 laura croft by the time i'm out of here oh man Anyway, back on topic. So, war gets declared. The Queen Mary is, I believe, in the middle of a voyage on September 3rd. And uh, the news immediately reaches them that uh, Nazi U-boats have started just sinking passenger ships that they find in the Atlantic. And so, everybody on board is kind of panicking. But, and I really, like, had some difficulty finding exact, like, exact notes on, like, how fast the Queen Mary was able to go, because I found, like, four different numbers that varied pretty greatly, so who knows, but uh, point is, for her time, Queen Mary was considered stupid fast, especially for a like cruise ship as big as she was. And dummy so, fast. Dummy fast, indeed. And so everybody on board was kind of freaking out. Uh, some of the onboard entertainment was like, yeah, I'll do my performance three times for like first class, second class, and third class passengers to calm everybody down. And 
supposedly that worked but uh on september 5th they arrived in the u.s because i believe she could make the voyage from scotland to new york in four days which is that, it's pretty that seems impressive. fast like that's for a, when i when i when i when i picture an old boat um the my the first thing that comes to my mind isn't fast so that sounds fast yeah it's uh it's crazy and we'll get into just how fast she was uh here in a little bit but uh up and up until this point queen mary was not the gray ghost she very much sported kind of a, a cruise liner paint job of those days I mean, basically picture the Titanic, like those big red smokestacks, the white uh, sort of superstructure, like all that stuff above deck, a black main hull, and then like a red kind of uh, water-lined hull. Like that's exactly the sort of paint job the Queen Mary had. But once it gets to the U.S., uh, the British Admiralty is pretty much like, hey, um chill out in the U.S., but we're going to need the majority of the crew to come back and kind of help with, you know, the fact that World War II is kicking off on our end. And so a skeleton crew stayed behind, and they start maintaining her, and one of the things that they do is they paint her all dark gray. And it's at this point that the Queen Mary begins transitioning to... Queen Mary, the Grey Ghost. But, uh, it's also... Ooh, ooh spooky. <laughs> but it's also at this point that the Queen Elizabeth, her sister ship, uh, had been in the dry docks and was, was still being completed. But, uh... You know, the everybody was pretty much convinced that the Queen Elizabeth was done for. Um, that either the Nazis were gonna just like sink her immediately or bomb her or whatever. And uh, it actually got to the point where the Nazis had kind of gathered uh, a bunch of ships or a bunch of U boats and things like that and were readying themselves for uh, the Queen Elizabeth to leave dry docks because they expected that the Queen Elizabeth as well as the Queen Mary would be converted into troop carriers, which, yeah, well, they were right. Um, but the British Admiralty pretty much radioed the crew of the Queen Elizabeth and was like, Hey, uh, Captain, uh, get the fuck out of there. And so instead of, like... <laughs> maintaining their initial route or doing any of the sort of like fanfare that they were supposed to with her setting off basically in the middle of the night they just cast her out of the dry docks and she full throttled no stopped uh to the u.s taking kind of an unorthodox path and so everyone in the u.s was like oh man such a shame that the queen elizabeth yeah, it was probably done for. And then the Queen Elizabeth just fucking showed up. What's up, bitches? <laughs> just uh, sporting. Like, they hadn't finished her paint job, so I'm pretty sure she was gray. Or just kind of, like, bare steel when she showed up. And, you know, everybody was kind of freaking out. Uh, the largest U.S. ship at the time that... Uh... Oh, I have it further down in my notes... Um, uh, where the hell is it? I can't find it. Anyway, it's, uh, oh, that's it. The USS West Point, which was also... I was going to guess, I was going to guess the Titanic 2 electric boogaloo. Yeah, not quite, but the USS West Point was there and all three ships were in a row in the New York Harbor looking all nice and pretty. So, March 21st, 1940, they're like, all right, Queen Mary, time to step it up. And again, uh, the Queen Mary fucking books it. And this time sails 
all the way to Singapore. I it, just the articles I was reading on the ship lacked kind of a greater context in the war of why it had to go all the way to Singapore in order to be sort of transformed into a troop ship, but it did. So Queen Mary goes all the way to Singapore in March of 1940, uh, gets 33 anti-aircraft guns fitted to her decks, a degaussing strip, which we'll return to in a little bit, and uh, a few... It said rocket launchers, but from my understanding at the time, rockets were really unreliable and kind of dumb, so I would wonder if that wasn't, like, something that they just barely used, because it was kind of... Rocket. Rocket was a looser, a looser term back in, back in ye old times. Yeah, it may have just been like, hey, we put this fucking fragmentation explosive on some sort of propulsion to launch it in the air at <laughs> planes that go by, but who knows. Um, also, don't don't mind my Googling. I needed a quick a quick reminder of where Singapore is. It's um, it's in Malaysia, which is just south of Vietnam for y'all listeners at home. Look at us Americans not knowing our geography. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so she, she chills out there for a little bit. But so I I read like, yeah, she gets fitted with a degaussing strip and I was like, what the fuck is that? And so I looked it up, and it sounds like something out of a fucking, like, crystals healed my gunshot wounds kind of science journal. It's like, yeah, by layering this fat fucking strip of, uh, like, metal a particular kind of metal around the entire length of the hull, it neutralizes the magnetic field of the ship and makes it less likely to trigger an underwater mine. Oh, that sounds like grounding. We've talked about grounding before, right? Not on the podcast. Oh yeah, well not not on the podcast. For for y'all who don't know, grounding is people who take a rod a metal rod with a wire on it they stick it into their yard like into the grass and feed a line through the window and onto a mat that they stand on and it's supposed to electrically ground your body which is good for you for reasons but so they basically grounded a ship is what it sounds like yeah, well, okay, so I'm reading that degaussing, uh, apparently they use it some in, like, modern hard drives and solid-state drives, that they can apparently build up, like, magnetic fields and that it helps to do that, but let's see. The degaussing process changes the magnetic domain where data is stored, and the shift in domain makes data unreadable and unable to be recovered. Oh, so they use it to destroy. Uh, oh. Okay, ship degaussing. Uh, systems of electrical cables are installed around the circumference of a ship's hull along with various metals running from bow to stern on both sides. A measured electrical current is passed through these cables to cancel out the ship's magnetic field. How effective. See, and like, this was my problem, is that a lot of degaussing is like, um, just talking about hard drives, and so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, we'll, we'll get into why it was kind of questionable as to whether it, uh, worked that well or not later. Uh, so from this point, uh, the Queen Mary took off to Sydney, Australia, uh, got called a cunt, got some bunk beds installed, 
uh, got some dormitories and a radar tower added as well. At this point, um, the UK is absolutely shitting a brick over the Suez Canal. Because if they lose the Suez Canal, they lose this an absolutely massive uh, sort of supply chain for them. And so they're really, really trying for uh, that to hold out. So the Queen Mary for a while just basically does a lapse between Australia and the Suez Canal. Just Australia, the Suez Canal, goes to Scotland, back to Suez Canal. Just thousands and thousands of troops uh, back and back and forth. But uh, part of how she's able to do this is that at full speed, uh, she was the fastest cruise liner of her time and the largest, and was so fast she outran military escorts and so had to go by herself. Uh, uh, I, I wonder um, why... Why is it the fastest and the biggest? Like, what were they... Like, it was supposed to be a cruise liner, I assume, from the beginning. Right. So what was the point of making it the fastest ship? I mean, I think the whole, like, being able to slap a label on your advertisement that says, across the Atlantic in four days of luxury, you know, for, like, the wealthy of Europe and America at the time, being like, yeah, you can be on another continent in four days, and it's going to be really fucking nice the whole time you're doing those four days. Like, that's appealing. And so... I, I do know that she had quite an impressive set of engines, which we will also get to later, and that that, uh, that was the major thing for why she was so fast. I mean, kind of right. a similar, pretty similar body shape to a lot of cruise liners at the time, but she just had absolute beefcakes of, of engines down there. But, uh... Because she had to go by herself, because she outran <laughs> all of the military escorts that could go with her, uh, she was under orders to never stop under any circumstances and to run at full speed ahead at all times. And also to sail in a zigzag pattern so that if she was spotted, uh, the... Hopefully, she would be so fast that she would outrun uh, whoever spotted her, which, seeing as how she could outrun the military escorts of her own country, was the case for the enemies, too. And she was spotted quite a few times, but never really caught, and they had no idea which direction she was actually going, because she was constantly zigging and zagging, and so... Was she headed to Europe? Was she headed back to the U.S.? Was she heading to the Suez Canal? It was just up to chance at any one time. I wonder how many extra miles that added to her uh, her journey. I'm sure quite a few. I do have the total number of nautical miles she ran, but we'll we'll save that for the end. So... Finally, in, uh, on December 22nd, good old uh, W. Church, Winston Churchill, proposes to the U.S. military, and this is, uh, sorry, I, I believe this is just after, no, oh, no, it couldn't be, right, okay, so this is, uh, well, fuck me, I'm forgetting what day Pearl Harbor happened. <laughs> I'm a good historian, I promise. December 7th. Okay, so yep, this is post, uh, this is post Pearl Harbor. For some reason, I, I fucking, the first date that came to my mind was Christmas. I was like, damn, that's fucked up if that's true. They really, they really did it to him. I mean, hey, George Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas Eve. So, 
one could argue that was kind of a dick move, but uh, it worked. The, Jap- so. the Japanese Japanese want to do that. They love Christmas. Did they actually? Well, they do now, but <laughs> maybe not back then. I think there may have been some events between <laughs> between their love of Christmas and uh, Pearl Harbor. But um, so W Church proposes that the two queens, Queen Elizabeth and uh, Queen Mary, could be used to transport U.S. troops uh, off to uh, off to Australia, off to the U.K., wherever they're needed. Um, the United States brass basically looks at it and is like I mean they're pretty big ships but how many do you think they can hold and Winston Churchill responds they can hold a whole company 14,000 men if you'll remember the Queen Elizabeth being rated for (laughs) 3,500 earlier in this 14,000 is a bit over that but uh, General Marshall is basically like yo churchy boy um, it, that's a whole fuckload of dudes on that ship and there are nowhere near enough lifeboats for all of them and uh, Winston Churchill responded with uh, lol Lamau, <laughs> and uh, basically, I mean, he had some very Churchillian quote that was like, "If it if it shortens the war by one day, then it will be worth it." And so, General Marshall is like, oh, "Shit, that's all you had to say," and signs off <laughs> on the whole thing. So, I re- I remember thinking like, thirty five hundred people is like. Like, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. Like, if you got a crowd of 3,500 people together, much less like 14,000. So, like, yeah. a lot of people. It's a fuckload, and we'll we'll get into how that caused some problems uh, as things go on. But, uh, so the Germans are basically about to win in the Suez Canal, but they are completely unprepared for the Queen Mary just uh, rolling up with uh, Rule Britannia, Britannia Rule the Waves blaring and dumping 14,000 fresh troops uh, onto the beaches, who uh, then basically proceed to completely turn around the uh the fighting in north africa and from there it's just a downhill slope for rommel and queen mary to the rescue oh so the queen mary was the downfall of rommel basically say that yeah the the men she was able to deliver to the defense of the suez canal basically won the whole north african theater or kept it from being lost to the point where we could kind of stabilize and win from there. But uh, apparently Hitler is so fucking pissed that he puts a one million Reichsmarks bounty on both of the queens, the Mary and the Elizabeth. Um, And this is a bit of spoilers, but in the end there would be no takers because both, both ships made it through the war. Um... The USS West Point, which we referred to earlier, which was the biggest U.S. ship at the time, uh, even when overloaded to a similar extent, could only transport 7,000 men, half that of what the Queen Mary was able to take with her. Uh, Also, because the Queen Mary used to be a luxury cruise liner, uh, the troops who were being brought over were always like, left pretty favorable reviews on uh, whatever the 1940s ship version of uh, Yelp Yelp was, or basically like yeah, uh, this plate, this thing slaps, uh, really good really good ship, good job uh, the main reason being because she used to be a luxury cruise liner 
she had a fucking thick kitchen like a huge kitchen and I believe it was the largest kitchen and then the largest freezer slash uh, refrigeration storage space of any troop transport ship across the entire war. So if you sailed on the Queen Mary as she was taking you across, you got considerably better food than any other transport ship used during the war Uh, because they were just able to keep the fresh food on hand. Uh, Apparently... (laughs) <laughs> which not gonna lie I started fucking cracking up when I read this just for the absurdity of it um so 14,000 guys on board all of them eating breakfast every morning uh each meal was supposed to take about 45 minutes and I believe they could do uh it was like five or six rotations with the amount of seating that they had for everybody but uh everybody's breakfast was eggs uh ham and i believe toast and so they said that the typically uh each each day of the voyage would have a designated ham man whose sole job it was <laughs> to just cut ham <laughs> because there were so many fucking people that they had to feed and breakfast for so many that one dude literally would have to work like 24 hours straight cutting ham for all of the troops on board for just one day and <laughs> this man this man at the end of at the end of the war in ni- 1945 he had he had like a Hattori Hanzo s- sword <laughs> and he could like cut up a ham in like <laughs> four four seconds flat just like slams the cleaver on the on the counter and the ham cuts itself into 20 pieces <laughs> where he does that thing where he like draws the sword like just like and then like it's it's done <laughs> I mean, basically. But, like, literally having to cut ham for 24 hours straight when they were like, yeah, one person would be picked for each day to do it. <laughs> like, can you imagine just being like, hey, Tim, you drew the short straw, you're ham man. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> like, <laughs> you just... I, I wonder I wonder if any of them ever hate, ate ham ever again. I, probably not from the cooking staff, but, like, the boys who were being shipped over were like, oh, fuck yeah, ham. And so, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I thought that was, that was pretty great. Um, but continuing on, she's, she's really, really nice, way fancier than a lot of her counterparts. Uh, generally well favored by the troops as well, because she was known for being safe, she was so fast, and with her whole, like, zigzag, stop-for-no-man uh, policies, th- there were points where people went overboard, and uh, the Mary just left them. Because Yee. their whole thing was like, if we stop, that is a chance that a U-boat has to hit us with a torpedo, and then one man has cost us 14,000 lives. So not stopping no matter what. And yeah, they are they are not the Marines. Yeah. <laughs> they really fucking aren't. Um but yeah, that it it was just known for being safe because it was so fast it just dip duck dived and dodged like any military vessels it came across. And I mean we'll we'll get into the like the few close calls that she had, but one of them was just a storm, and so that doesn't really count. (laughs) Um, Anyway, generally, great reviews. Uh, As a part of this, I did watch a series of videos that was like a deep dive uh, on on the Queen Mary. I also thought this was really fucking funny, because the first part of... The first part of the series, uh, the guy says, like, oh, yeah, 
the the Queen Mary, you know, so many ships of World War II are remembered for their tragic past, but not the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary, the greatest transport ship that ever lived. And then he starts part two of, like, the tragic past of the Queen Mary. And it's just like, okay, yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Staying All consistent, right. I see. But, um... Anyway, uh... A few little interesting tidbits that made the Queen Mary stick out a bit before we continue further. So, you remember how I was saying that the uh, the British military kind of took over, like, the final bit of construction? Yeah. So, a big part of that was the, the British believed that they may have to press... Uh, press a lot of like uh, commercial ships into service at some point and so they said hey we'll pay for her decks to be basically reinforced built to a higher standard in case uh, she ever needs to run cargo and so uh, her decks were reinforced and she had basically a we learned from the titanic uh, sealed bulkhead system uh, throughout her belly to uh, sort of prevent how much damage leaks could really do. On top of that, uh, they built her with a double hull. So any any part of the hull that was potentially kind of going to be exposed to the waterline had like an external layer uh of, of hull kind of reinforced by a secondary layer underneath it. So even if there was like a minor scrap or, uh, you know, something bad going down, there were effectively two holes it had to get through before things went bad. Uh, I believe there were 18 uh, watertight, watertight parts as well, but I, I mentioned that. Uh, and yeah, uh, she she generally was just a, a pretty pretty safe gal overall. But um, the one the one problem that she had, and I think this may have been a problem of a lot of ships at the time. But hey, I didn't do research on them. Um, the uh, the ship was basically built without air conditioning because she was meant to be a trans transatlantic. Uh, ocean liner so she was meant to be in the uh, the cold seas kind of running up north um, and so they were kind of like eh why the hell would we put in AC when it's going to be freezing most of the time they did have some forms of air conditioning in like the very large like gathering halls especially those that were kind of deeper into the hull of the ship but for the most part there was not that much air circulation. Which, with her being pressed into service and starting to run to Malaysia and uh, Australia, there were a couple points where they recorded the temperature in, like, the sort of troop compartments on the ship under a light load, so this wasn't, like, affected by body heat, as over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you know, I bet they had a ham, the ham man. He used to, he, <laughs> he, he used to, dead. he used to cook the ham and and he used to cook the ham and chop the ham. And at a certain point, he just didn't have to cook it anymore. It was already done. <laughs> yeah, I was just like Jesus Christ, because like it, some of these days. Uh, for reference, Jack and I are, are Missouri boys, and so when it gets, like, good and humid out here and, like, the sun's really out in the summer, I, like, I've like i seen it get to, like, 108, like, I think two times in my life, maybe. So imagining 110 just as kind of the standard as it's going through the more tropical regions of its route, man... Uh, for that reason, many of the troops uh, decided to sleep on the decks, because at least out there you got breezes on occasion. 
Um, this was also probably due to room to some extent because the quote unquote beds, and I say beds here loosely because they were really like a canvas sheet pulled taut across a rectangular metal frame. Um, they had 18 inches between each one. So nice. You you could lay on your back and like fit into it decently, but if you like tried to roll over or do basically anything, you like bumped the guy above you. <laughs> so I'm just picturing the uh I'm just, I'm just picturing like the uh those like crappy like aluminum soccer benches just with like a bed sheet on them basically like i seeing the photos i was like jesus christ that looks terrible um but just imagining that and then it being 110 degrees not <laughs> accounting for like literally probably like 5000 dudes all sleeping in the same well at, when they were running like 14000 they were hot bunking so uh, for those unaware of the practice, if you were ever on a ship where there were more people than there were beds, you basically shared uh, a bed someone and slept in shifts. So you'd sleep for six hours, and then the next guy would come and wake you up, and you'd leave. He'd sleep for six hours, the next guy would come and wake you up, and uh, r repeat for all 24 hours of a day. So, understandably, I think I would have been sleeping on the decks, too, because, holy shit, that sounds miserable. Yeah, it's like a human lasagna. <laughs> God damn it. Avast ye, me mateys. This be part one of a two-part episode we're going to have part two coming out in a couple weeks where we will hear the thrilling conclusion of the story of the HMS Queen Mary, a.k.a. the Grey Ghost. See you soon. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, call and hear the ancient song of sailors long forgone. Sailors still to be A sweet and solemn tune Spoke gently by the tide O oh, Johnny, Johnny, fall Join the song